and welcome to Corpse Club, the official podcast of DailyDead.com. I am one of your co-hosts, Brian Christopher, and I am being joined today by Emily Von Sela, as well as Derek Anderson. And I think we took a wrong turn because it seems like we're lost in the woods here, folks. What, uh, what happened here? <laughs> Not quite sure. Don't know how we got here, but I hope it's going to be a good adventure. Yeah, I don't know. Anything I heard... could be popping out at us. Not sure. <laughs> Uh, I heard this strange like singing voice that I just started following it. And then I, I don't know where we are. Oh, see, I was following some crazy lights. Oh, nice. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Derek, what brought you in? Was it, uh, was there like some fish jumping that you saw or? <laughs> yes. I've been looking to catch some fish and also I'm so cold. I'm just drawn to the flames that I see flickering in the distance. <laughs> it's been a long winter. <laughs> Indeed. Well, we're lost, but at least we're here together and we're here to talk folk horror. Um, you know, spring is finally springing in most areas. It seems to have taken its sweet ass time getting here, uh, but spring is here. So we're going to celebrate by talking about all the horrible things that can happen in the, the light of day uh, during the spring. Uh, we are going to be kind of you know, the, the catalyst for us talking today uh, was the documentary that just came out, uh, Woodlands Dark and Days Bewitched uh, by Kirla Janice. Um, it is a extensive documentary on folk horror going all the way back, uh, to what's kind of seen as like the, the unholy trilogy, as they, they mention uh, Michael Reeves, Witchfinder General, um, Piers Haggard's Blood on Satan's Claw and Robin Hardy's The Wicker Man. Um, and so the, you know, then the documentary goes through just years and, and uh, years and decades worth of folk horror movies, kind of digging into the various uh, signposts and benchmarks for what makes folk horror and talking about different movies from all over the world. You know, they, they start with England, but, you know, they talk about America, they talk about Australia, uh, they get into, you know, the Eastern Bloc countries, there's uh, Asian countries, uh, and it's kind of really fascinating because, you know, you, you look at it and it's over three hours long, but you realize it takes that long to even get close to, like, kind of trying to define what folk horror is. Um, so they took three hours. I'm going to be a jerk and see if anybody here can do it in a few sentences. So, Derek, how do you define folk horror? Oh, an envious task you've given me. Uh, you know, I think for me, it's always been kind of like how the documentary even tries to answer this question initially is just to me, it's always been kind of this mother nature esque type of horror, this rural, usually like a rural type of horror. And it being from Minnesota, I think of like the prairie lands and that aspect of it. So I've always just kind of associated it with mother nature and I guess you could just say like, well, then Friday the 13th could be a folk horror film because it takes place primarily outdoors. And uh, but I feel like it, it, it goes that extra step in connecting to Mother Nature and maybe even having Mother Nature strike back, which also sounds like ecological horror. But I'm, I'm going <laughs> to stick with that answer. <laughs> sounds good to me. Uh, Emily, you want to add to that at all? Um, I definitely agree in the the natural component. I feel like that that's there for so many folk horror movies. Um, I think adding to it, I would say that folk horror likes to focus on something that was here before, before the modern age, before, you know, colonization, before, you know, things change, just, you know, an era that is long gone, but somehow remnants of it remain. And that's where we pull our story from. Yeah. And I think that's an interesting element of folk horror because it's, yeah, it's one of those, it's that subgenre that says like, oh, you think you know from old? Like they they talk about, like when you look at the Wicker Man, like Catholicism, like that's the new kid in town compared to what the people on this island, kind of the, that paganism, those paganist rituals, um, you know, have been around well before anything, you know, even remotely resembling Catholicism was around. Uh, so, you know, the, the word old takes on, I think, a different connotation in something like folk horror. It goes way back and it's um yeah I, I think those two things are big elements of it the the natural element and the kind of the pastoral 
and the the ancient element to it. Um, I am a little mad, Derek, that you stole my thunder because at some point I was going to try and make the argument that Friday the Thirteenth is folk horror because it does wow. take place in nature. <laughs> it does involve kind of like this curse of the land in you know that takes form in in the form of Jason Voorhees. But you know, it's I, I think that's also one of the fun things about folk horror is there's a lot of things that you could make the argument for because you know they're they're they make a point of it in the documentary to talk about how uh, one of the interviewees I thought was interesting said that like he had to stop thinking about it like a subgenre and start thinking about it more like a musical node like there are kind of elements and like melodic elements to these movies that kind of help define them, even though you can't really define folk horror. Um, but there are just the you know, things you can recognize in it. And I guess it's kind of similar to that thing where the saying about uh, obscenity or uh, obscenity, like you can't define it, but you know, it when you see it, that kind of thing. And I think that's mm -hmm. pretty true of, of folk horror. Um, so in terms of the, the documentary, um, I really enjoyed it. I thought it was, very comprehensive, at least uh, I, I will admit that I went into it as kind of somewhat of a novice with folk horror. Like I had obviously seen some folk horror movies, but um, if anyone had asked me what folk horror was, I would have shrugged and said, you know, I don't know, fields, forests, and I, I, I couldn't tell you. Um, so this was a good exploration. And I also like that, you know, it kind of started with the core of England, but it's spread out into other areas. Um, and really kind of talked about how things are different in those other areas. Like one thing that I thought was really interesting in the, the Slavic countries was the discussion about how like in the West, the conflict in folk horror comes from people who are more kind of suburban and people who are more modern with groups who are involved in those more pastoral elements. It's so it's like the conflict between two different dogmas or two different like communities, whereas the conflict in Slavic countries and, and like, you know, Eastern European countries, it's the people who are in those pastoral communities conflicting with those, you know, various rituals or, or spirits or entities. Um, so it's just, you know, a lot of interesting stuff I think came out of, and I don't think I could do any better job at trying to define folk horror at this point, but I do think I have a better feel for it. Um, Emily, what, uh, what was your take on the documentary? How did you enjoy it? I really loved it. I think it was just so, so widespread and so all encompassing. And I loved the way, you know, it spans the world. It kind of centers itself on England to start with, because I think that most of us, when we start think of thinking of folk horror, we kind of gravitate towards the Wicker Man and that type of stuff. But then it expanded from there and kind of used that as a jumping off point to explore different films before going all around the world and showing, you know, how folk horror differs from place to place, but all the commonalities that it has in, in place as well. Um, but, you know, the mark of a great film documentary is when you walk away with a giant list of movies yeah. that you haven't watched yet <laughs> and you need to check out. And this is so full of that. Like <laughs> there's just a laundry list of amazing looking things that I can't wait to get my hands on and explore further. Yeah, it covered 200 films, like 200 plus films. Um, so it was not wanting for for content. <laughs> wow. Yes. <laughs> uh, Derek, how about you? Yeah, it was, like you said, Emily, something that I'm, it's going to be like the stepping stone for so many different movie viewings for me and really just help define like my interpretation of folk horror because kind of like how the documentary initially focuses on the English countryside and that type of folk horror. Cause I always kind of thought of that as, as folk horror being married to like that location or like Northeast America in the uh, colonial era era um, with the Salem witch trials and that kind of thing. Um, but now it's like, I see that every region is, has its own unique folk horror and movies that I didn't even think of as folk horror can be viewed in that context, like Candyman and, you know, so many other movies where it's like, oh, I can look at it this way. And there's a whole other like thing to unpack with it. And so it, it just, it really was uh, like an educational uh, experience as much as it was entertaining. And yeah, like, like, I'd feel like I just need to 
write down all these movies and just hunt them down and, and watch them and experience kind of where this documentary really sheds light on so many different things and so many things that are like timely to today, even if they were made, you know, 50 years ago, 60 years ago, it's, it's, it feels even more timely now than it maybe did even when it was initially released. Some of them depressingly so. And I think that'll be yeah. the case for one of the movies <laughs> we, we talk about today. Um, but yeah, absolutely. Um, and for those who are interested, uh, you can catch uh, the uh, the documentary on Shutter is streaming on Shutter. Uh, they also have a whole mess of uh, folk horror movies that they have streaming on there to kind of package with it. Uh, and I th believe Severin, because I think it's a Severin production, uh, they released a whole big box set of the um, uh, both the documentary and a bunch of the movies that that were discussed. Uh, do either of you have that, Emily or Derek? I do, but so far I've only watched the ones that overlap with what Shutter has. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. so I haven't actually cracked open the box yet, but I have seen some of the films included in the box. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. And I, I don't have the box set, but I, I really was kind of that was on my wish list when I saw it come out, and then <laughs> I've been kind of, I guess because there's the ones on Shutter, I'm like, well, I'll just watch those first, but then I know that you could really go a much deeper dive with the box set. So I think that would be a good purchase at some point. Yeah. Yeah. No, it, it looks, you know, the, the packaging looks beautiful. It looks like a really well put together, uh, well put together package. So, uh, if and you so are considerate of Severin films to, you know, think about us as they're releasing this three hour long documentary and then think, Oh, maybe people want to watch some of these movies. Let's do that too. Yeah. Yeah. It's way too often that you'll get like a documentary. It's like, oh, I'd love to catch all of these. Oh, it's not available anywhere. Fantastic. Uh, <laughs> yep. so, so, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I'm sure Severin was doing it completely altruistically and did not see any kind of a, a market value for for taking that approach. No, not. <laughs> <laughs> not at all. Of course, it was just a very nice coincidence. Yes, yeah. it, I'm sure. <laughs> All right. So I think we'll go from there to, you know, we've talked a little bit about folk horror in general. We've talked about the documentary. Uh, and I think we're going to spend the rest of the episode uh, just doing a round robin on some of the folk horror that has connected with us and that that we want to discuss. Um, so, yeah, I think we've each got a couple of picks. Uh, we'll do a couple of rounds and just, you know, see some of the samples that the the subgenre or, you know, as they say, that the musical node has to offer to us. Uh, so let's start with Emily. What do you want to talk about first? Uh, I'll go with V, uh, V-I-Y, V V-Y. I could not tell you how to pronounce that either. I've seen it for, I've seen the title for years, but yeah, uh, we'll say V. We'll and say then, V because it's easier for uh, my American palate. Yeah. At least if we're saying it wrong, like we'll consistently say it wrong and then yeah. can yell at all three of us instead of, you know, picking on one person. Oh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> so this one is a 1967 Russian film that was based on a story written by Nikolai Gogol. Um, and total transparency, I've never read the story. I'm not very well read. I watch movies instead. So um, I have no thoughts whatsoever on how the translation worked or the adaptation, any of that. Uh, but as a film, it was really interesting. It's about um, a seminary student who um, is called out to a local farm to spend three nights praying over the body of this recently deceased girl um, as an the girl secretly is a witch, spoiler alert. You kind of suspect that going in because of earlier events in the film. Um, but every night things get increasingly creepy. Weird stuff starts happening, the body rises, things start flying around the room. And then on the third night, demons. And it's really cool just given the limitations of what they were working with as far as effects go, as far as, you know, camera trickery. Um, they really pulled out all the stops in making it legitimately creepy at times, you know, doing a lot of really interesting effects work before, obviously, the advent of CGI and, you know, in a film industry that was, you know, still, I think, think coming into its own. I feel like I could be wrong, but I feel like Russia's, Russian cinema didn't really kind of hit its stride until a little bit later. Um, 
forgive me if that's incorrect, but, you know, they really did a lot with very little in making a film that was really unique. It's got some really creepy moments and some uncanny visuals that just kind of set you back and really, really make the most of the story. Yeah, I, I checked this one out uh, on Shutter uh, when you said that you know this was one of the movies that you wanted to talk about, uh, and it was it was a very interesting experience. Uh, first of all, like you said, the effects, uh, you know, this is a nineteen late sixties, um, and the effects actually reminded me of a much earlier film in a good way, though. Uh, Haxon. Um, yes. The you know, a lot of like the background effects that they use to like you know. I'm sure it wasn't green screen, but whatever the the equivalent was in 1960s, you know, however they accomplished that, uh, the things, you know, they're clearly in a sound stage, but they've got like these really cool graphics going on in the background, especially in the beginning where, you know, it looks like he's flying, you know, with the witch. Um, and I also thought it was interesting that like it's creepy, but there's also kind of a whimsical, playful tone to it. Uh, so like yes. that scene where where she's riding him across the countryscape, like she, there's the the music isn't threatening. It's like very whimsical. It's very melodic, um, and it's actually kind of a stark contrast when they land. His like immediate reaction is to beat the crap out of her with a stick. And that's kind of the catalyst for this whole thing, because, you know, this is big spoiler alert, but you'll see where this is going. Um, you know, this is the same witch, you know, from the beginning is the same witch that he winds up having to look after and, you know, and pray over over those three nights. Um, I have to ask, I was rooting for the witch. Um, was everybody else? And is that what like was the movie rooting for the witch or was that just are we looking that at that through like a 2022 lens? I feel like the movie wasn't working very hard to make us work root for the seminary student. So <laughs> <laughs> I like defaulted to the witch because I'm like, you deserve every second of this torment, buddy. Yeah, you did hmm. this. And so like as the film goes on, like he's kind of a a funny character in a little bit of a doofy way, but you're mm -hmm. never really fully on his side because he's kind of not a full jackass, but like a partial jackass. Yeah, I think it plays it that well. And there's, you know, the like almost like a sense of this entitlement or this superiority complex. And then seeing that go through the ringer, I think is as a viewer, you feel like there's some just desserts happening there. <laughs> but, uh, so I feel like you said with that playfulness, it kind of, maybe they knew what they were doing a little bit there, but maybe it just comes out a little bit more, especially watching it now versus when it came out. Yeah. I mean, I think at the very least, you're not supposed to see this guy as being very bright because when we first meet him and the whole gaggle of seminary students, like they are a bunch of meatheads, like they're all idiots. Like when, when the, uh, the, the head priest comes out to like dismiss them, like some of them are like tackling a goat and some of them are just like <laughs> rolling around in the dirt. Like these are clearly not the sharpest, sharpest knives in the drawer. And so, and I think there's, you know, a commentary being said about, you know, people of that position because they, they refer to him as a philosopher, you know, and I, I have to think that's something of a joke because he is the farthest thing from a philosopher. Like he is just quick to temper. He is like, you know, very entitled. Uh, he is, and just not very smart. Um, yeah. So I, I think at the very least, you know, there's a mixed bag that this movie is trying to present with this person as being the quote unquote protagonist. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that, I don't know, and maybe there's something there as far as um, getting down to the line between Christianity and folk traditions since he you know is supposed to be propped up as not only as a philosopher but like a leader or a potential leader to be of a community once he gets through the seminary um you know versus this you know i guess country bumpkin witch who immediately <laughs> gets one on one over on him yeah i think it's interesting that you mentioned superstition because you know there's that 
that conflict of looking down at you know the the old ways um but also they're they're constantly talking about you know uh, oh, I have to make this circle and she can't touch me if I'm in here, if I'm in this circle, if I don't make eye contact, you know, even after he and another spoiler where like he loses <laughs> at the end of it, he's he's dead. <laughs> um, and they're talking about him afterwards, a couple of his friends from the seminary school. And they they're both talking about like, well, if you would have just done this, this and this in terms of like, you know, kind of like catholic you know uh, uh some kind of a a catholic uh for the sake of you know a, for lack of a better term a catholic superstition in the kind of the frame of this movie he would have been fine uh so it's just i i think that conflict is definitely at play of the you know the modern you know and, and we're modern in this case is what i think this takes place in like the 17th 18th century or something like that um so. but it's you know it's interesting because it's you know everything has something older than it. Um, so even though this takes place in the past, again, it's dealing with something that is rooted a lot further in the past than what these seminary students are used to dealing with. Yeah. 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 It's um, kind of um, like, Oh, just the open mindedness. Like if you just open your mind and not focus in on like, this is the only right way to do it. Like you said, he might've survived that night. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, he, the grand moral of the story is don't mess with witches. Yeah, like don't yeah. be a dick. Like if he <laughs> yeah. if he wasn't an asshole to the witch in the first place, like even if she was coming on to him, there's a better way of like saying you're not interested other than being like, oh God, no, you're hideous, never in a million years. You know, if he had been right. more respectful about it, maybe he wouldn't have been in that position in the first place. So <laughs> all right. Well, uh, let's move on to Derek. What do you want to start with? All right. So the the first one I want to talk about is the 1958 film Lake of the Dead, uh, which is based on a novel of the same name by Andre Bjerk, uh, who also co-stars in the movie. And it's this Norwegian uh, film. And the book itself is like this really beloved uh, Norwegian kind of murder mystery ghost story type of tale. Uh, with, so to, even to this day, I, I believe it's a pretty beloved uh, work of literature in Norway. And I have a lot of Norwegian blood in me. So I was like, oh, I should I feel like I should watch this and and see what all the fuss is about. And it's it's a really it's only 76 minutes. It's a really quick watch. Um, but essentially, it's like these six friends going to a cabin in the woods. I mean, what could go wrong? <laughs> um, and one of the friends brother has been staying there and she hasn't heard from him. So she's worried about him. And when they get there, they find that the brother is missing. Um, his dog is found dead. And then while they're trying to figure out what happened, the like local constable tells them that the lake where the cabin is located is kind of this, uh, this folklore legend amongst the locals that there's a ghost uh, that emerges from the lake. Um, and he will convince you to want to drown yourself in the lake because years ago there was another brother who killed his sister and her uh, lover because he was jealous and now his ghost kind of is supposedly haunts that area so it, it kind of turns into like a scooby-doo mystery of sorts as all these friends are like partly vacationing still and like drinking beer and sun tanning but they're also kind of chipping away at this murder mystery and trying to figure out what happened to the brothers so there's there's a there's a real like playful tone to it and there's some actually really good like slapstick comedy in there as well uh, because the main character in the group of friends is kind of a klutz and and just people just have a lot of poke fun at him and he pokes fun back at them. And so there's like a real playful banter, but there's also this very serious storyline of like, yeah, people might be dead and there might be a murder on the loose and this place might be haunted, but you know, we're just trying to figure it out, but it's, it's, it's uh, it kind of taps into, I guess what I took away from it is it, it taps into like how you can project yourself onto a local like urban legend or folklore story and how that can bring out the worst in you and you almost become the legend yourself. So it was really interesting how, like how people, how this brother character kind of projected himself into that ghost story and it kind of leads him to do certain things that are a bit murderous. <laughs> 
So I'll be honest, I, I have not seen this one yet. Um, I'm interested, is this, is it kind of a thing where it's bringing in that element of like, you're bringing in your own baggage and kind of like you're bringing in, you're, you're almost kind of haunting yourself kind of a thing? Definitely, yeah. Because as, as the movie goes on, we find out that the brother character of one of the friends even though he seems like a nice guy at first, he has a lot of baggage and he is very jealous and he actually kind of becomes more and more like the, the ghost character, the urban legend uh, as the movie goes on. And we, as we kind of trace his backstory. So it, it definitely shows how in, in this case, like these people from the city going into the, this cabin and this countryside are, it kind of, almost gives him an excuse to act a certain way and become like this local ghost story himself. So it's a very, it's almost like a reverse haunting in a way. It's very interesting and actually had, you know, I, I kind of thought I had it figured out and I, I was kind of taken aback by some of the twists and turns that were in it. So it's a, it's a fun, uh, almost like a clue in, in a clue, the board game in a cabin. Um, so it's, it's, it's a lot of fun and also gives you some stuff to think about too. Emily, is this one you've seen? Uh, I haven't seen the original. I did watch the Norwegian remake from, I think like 2010 or 2011 that Shutter had up a few months ago. And it sounds oh, like nice. the plot is pretty consistently similar. So I don't know that they took any big turns, um, or just, you know, updated it for a more modern setting, but I definitely want to check out the original. Uh, it's, it's funny. It actually also, well, a couple things that, that, uh, brings up is that a lot of these movies have had remakes done like, uh, V, um, uh, when, uh, Emily, I only realized a couple days ago that, uh, after I'd seen the 1967 version, that there's also a 2014 version. So I was very glad to hear that you were talking about the 67 version when we started tonight. <laughs> um, but yeah, the, you know, these are, and again, I think it goes back to that point that these are stories that don't lose their potency or the, you know, they, they don't lose the resonance. Um, it's also interesting that, uh, this, the Lake of the Dead sounds similar, Derek, to a book you introduced me to uh, in a previous episode, Nothing But Black and Teeth uh, by Cassandra oh, Kaw. yes. You know, it's uh, which I, uh, takes place in Japan, but there's something very similar there where, you know, it's not just about the haunting. It's the the what people are bringing in and like the energy that people are bringing in to the property. Um, so it sounds like there's some kind of similar themes as as that book. That is the perfect comparison. I didn't even think of that. And I think if you do a, like a book, well, I guess you could read Lake of the Dead, the book, <laughs> and then also read Nothing But Black and Teeth, but that would be a really good like page to screen double feature just because, yeah, it's it's more about like giving yourself over to the legend, but kind of using that as an excuse to do, you know, murderous things or to like lose yourself and become another person entirely kind of like a, almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy, mm -hmm. but you're kind of giving yourself over to this legend that has been kept alive by the locals. And even though the locals really, other than the police officer, they're really not a part of the story. It's like the lake is the other character. And it's like the mirror, the image that you see in the lake. And I know there's kind of a, a cool segment in the documentary about drowning and how, how that kind of is, uh, the, the lake is like a community aspect of a, t of a community and how you can kind of drown and lose yourself in it. Um, so I think it touches on some of that too. And at the end of the day, it's just kind of a lot of fun as well. So it's, it's, uh, it's a, a, a very different kind of whodunit. <laughs> very nice. Very nice. Cool. Uh, well, I guess that brings me up um, and I'm going to go with one of the, the prototypical examples of a folk horror movie and do Witchfinder General. Um, 1968 by Michael Reeves, starring Vincent Price as Matthew Hopkins, who was uh, you know, based loosely off of a an actual uh, person, uh, also based off of a novel of the same name. And... You know, the, the the witch hunt narrative is one that's been around 
since the witch hunts. Um, but it's been one that's been brought back for various purposes. Um, you know, I, I think the earliest I can think this century, or I guess this would be last century, mid 20th century was uh, Arthur Miller's The Crucible. You know, it's that story of you know using witch hunts to talk about the really crappy political stuff that was going on at the time. So for Arthur Miller, uh, you know, he was obviously talking about uh, the, you know, the, the McCarthy era, uh, you know, blacklisting and, and the, the communist quote unquote witch hunts um and with witch finder general you know i don't know that he's necessarily pointing to any one phenomenon but it's you know again unfortunately a story and a theme that is relevant throughout the centuries and as we all know continues to be relevant today um i think one of the things that kind of really sticks out for me for witch finder general is that it's it's a very different role for Vincent Price because he's used to playing villains and he's used to playing like mustache twirling villains, but there's always kind of that twinkle in his eye when he's doing it. Like either they're charming or they've got like, you know, he's kind of winking at the camera from time to time here. He is just a vile person, you know, and he is, uh, I, I think part of what's also interesting about the Witchfinder general is that there's no real tie to anything that's actually supernatural in this movie. You know, they are very clear to say like, you know, witches aren't a thing, you know, at least as, um, at least people like, you know, Matthew Hopkins would purport witches are a thing. You know, there's, there's not people flying around on brooms and stealing babies and, you know, cursing people. Uh, there are just people that get into the crosshairs of people with power like Matthew Hopkins uh, and how he, you know, twisted that for his own ends. Um, so yeah, it's not a, it's definitely not like a happy-go-lucky fun watch, uh, but it is very good. Uh, and it was also interesting in the documentary, they talked about how it's definitely got elements of like a Western to it, you know, where it's kind of like this, um, you know, you see a lot of like horse chases and uh, you know, it's kind of a revenge story in there. So, you know, it definitely takes some, some Western elements as well. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's just a solid movie. Uh, you know, it's not one you want to watch if you want to have necessarily a good time, but I think it's definitely a worthwhile view. I've um, been holding off on watching this movie. Um, it's something that's been on my list for a long time, but when it comes down to it, I'm either in a mood specifically for a Vincent Price movie, and therefore I kind of go towards one of the more fun mm -hmm. ones or the lighter ones. and. You know, I know this movie seems to be one that kind of carries a lot of weight to it. So I want to be in the right mood for it. And every time I look at it, I'm just like, mm, tonight's not the night. Mm -hmm. It's not time because I want to do it right. <laughs> but so it, it's been on my shelf for like two years and I haven't watched it yet. I will say, it, oh, sorry, go ahead there. Oh, no, it's yeah, it's it is. Uh, it's hard. It, it's fascinating because like you said, it's it's Vincent Price like not as you're used to seeing him and also just the violence in the movie, the different ways that they tortured, like people they claimed were witches and just kind of really not holding back and not, not uh, looking away at some of those acts. And I know they're kind of showing how that correlated to like the Vietnam war at the time. And, but it's amazing, like thinking of how young that director was and just how they, it was almost like an experimental film. And yet he's working with, like this legend of horror cinema it's just amazing that like vincent price even agreed to do it to some extent just because it was such a big risk for him but then maybe he just really was drawn to being so different than audiences were used to seeing him as yeah you know this is this is kind of price's chance to step out of the the camp limelight and do something i think a little bit different and i think he takes full opportunity you know he really invests himself in being a piece of shit and he does it convincingly. <laughs> um, you know, I, I will say Emily that, you know, it's, it's not a super easy watch because, you know, they, they don't shy away from the ways that Hopkins abuses his power, but it's not, I don't think fully nihilistic just in terms of like, there's comeuppance to be found. And, you know, um, you know, there's, 
I don't know if walking off into the sunset is quite the way to put it with, with the way the protagonist resolved, but um, you know, as, as horror movies go, there are definitely, you know, worse endings for, than, than the way this wraps up. So, okay. um, you know, getting from A to B will be a harrowing experience, but you know, you won't walk away from it feeling like you need a hug and a nap. Okay. That's good. And if I feel like I need, you know, a Vincent Price palate cleanser to get him back to the good side of my mind, then I can just follow it up with House on Haunted Hill and go to bed happy. That's the way to do it. <laughs> Sounds like a plan. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's go around for round two. Uh, so, Emily, that'll be back to you. Uh, my round two pick was the 2009 film Wakewood. Um, it was directed by David Keating. It was an Irish uh, movie, uh, stars Aidan Gillen as um, a man. He and his wife uh, moved to this tiny little Irish town um, after the untimely death of their young daughter. Um, and they just kind of, you know, they settle in, they're living with the grief um, just kind of dealing with it in the day by day. And then one night they're out for a walk and they kind of come across the rest of the village engaged in this strange ritual. And when they confront the mayor, the town leader, whatever he is, played by Timothy Spall, um, he lets them in on the town secret, which is that they have the power to bring back uh, members of the community from the dead for a period of three days. Um, and if, you know, they want to take part in this, they have to agree to become members of the town for the rest of their lives because it's kind of a, a cyclical give and take. Like, okay, you can have this, but it takes the remains of someone else from the village so that when your time comes along, you know, your loved one is going to be used to bring back someone else's loved one so that they can say goodbye, so that they can have a few moments longer. And it's a really cool thing. Unfortunately, their daughter uh, is brought back evil, not because of the ritual or because of their daughter. It's because of something they did. You'll learn about it in the movie. But um, I think it's a really cool movie because there's nothing negative about the the traditions or the culture itself. Like there's nothing inherently evil about what they're doing. It's something that everybody um, consents to and agrees to. And it's just part of living within this community and it's understood that we're here for each other and we're going to give each other this last gift um and it's just kind of part of their tiny little culture but at the same time you know when they're conducting the ritual to bring back the daughter timothy spall talks about you know he has this great scene where he's you know kind of you know overseeing everything, calling out the different steps, saying words, leading the people in, you know, call and reply and that kind of thing. But he tells them, we've done this for years and we don't know, we don't know the why. We don't know why this works. We don't know where it came from. All we know is that it works. So having something like that in the modern era that ties so far back to something that came before that we don't know its ultimate, um, you know, starting point, and we don't know why it is. It's just something that we continue doing is something that I find really fascinating about that story and just kind of about the whole, t the whole thing in general. See, that's an interesting premise too, because it brings up that idea of like there being a cost for things. Yeah. Uh, and I think what's different about Wakewood is that usually that cost is way more than what most people would be willing to to spend you know and i think even in some of the 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 movies we're going to talk about today you know the the cost is real steep um but the fact that here that cost is something that people you know it's it's a sacrifice but it's also something people are willing to pay um and it's not like inherently like detrimental to like one or more people. Um, so I, I really like that they're playing with that idea that, you know, this, that sacrifice doesn't need to be, you know, a capital S sacrifice of like a whole other person, you know, it can be chipping in, you know, for, for lack of a better term um, to, to kind of keep these rituals going. Yeah. And um, lost what I was going to say. Forget that. Never mind. Keep going. <laughs> no worries. I, 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 
I haven't seen Wakewood, but I love that stance of like, we don't know why we do it. And like, just, I don't know. I feel like that's refreshing where it's not completely spelled out. Like here's, you know, here's the, the lineage that you can trace back and where it's not inherently evil. And it's more like a, it can be manipulated depending on who uses it. So like, I, I think that's really taps into like folk horror, like what works so well about folk horror is like the manipulation or just how it inherently doesn't have to be evil. It's just kind of how you look at it. And, uh, and yeah, and you, not uh, everything needs to be explained. It. it can just be here. <laughs> yeah. This is a thing that we do and we celebrate and we don't advertise it to the outside world because we don't want them to know that we're crazy. But <laughs> <laughs> but it's something that we, you know, continue and that we celebrate. And it's part of this this community that we have. And it also really ties in with that idea of things that are passed down, because like, you know, if you look at it like a family recipe, like by the time it gets down three or four generations, the people, the recipe, people probably don't know why they're doing certain things. They just know it makes a really tasty dish at the end of it. Um, so there's definitely something to that idea of, you know, this is just something we've always done. And, um, you know, maybe, you know, sometimes you need to have that investigation of, because I, I remember I worked for someone uh, who talked about how like this family recipe included, like it was for like a turkey or something like that. And part of the recipe was to cut off the wings before you put it in the oven. And the family kept doing that, you know, for a couple of generations afterwards. But then they found out like the only reason that she was doing it in the first place was because her oven wasn't big enough to fit the whole bird in without cutting off the wings. <laughs> So it just, oh, you know, it. It, it's, it's interesting that conversation about the things that we do because that's the way it's always been done, you know, and we don't always necessarily take in the context of, of where that started. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. Uh, so I think we're uh, around to Derek. All right. So for pick number two, we're going to Australia for the 1981 movie Allison's Birthday. Mm. And so if you're not familiar, the the kind of the setup for the movie is uh, Allison, uh, when she was 16, she was doing a seance and at school and the seance went wrong and actually made connection with the other side. And it was a spirit claiming to be her father telling her not to go home for her 19th birthday. And so flash forward a few years after that, and as the little subtitles at the bottom tell us, this is Allison now at like 18 years, 11 months, 26 days old. And so we know her birthday is her 19th birthday is coming up and she gets a call from her aunt and uncle um, asking her to come home with, uh, for her birthday for like a big party that they're going to have for her. And they're going to have like her cousins and her aunts and uncles come over. Um, her parents actually died in a car accident when she was little. So these are her aunt and uncle have kind of become her parental figures uh, over her childhood and into her young adulthood. And so she ends up going there and is dropped off by her boyfriend and it's it's like not it's kind of you get the sense that it's kind of out it's more like suburban country it's not really like like it's close enough where her boyfriend pete can kind of like come and see her every day because she gets freaked out by the house and she wants to go to the beach and just get away from it all and you kind of see her over time uh refamiliar refamiliarize herself with her childhood and like wander around the yard and her childhood bedroom has been untouched so it's kind of like it was when she was a little girl and they, they, uh, she discovers, uh, this area that they tell her about, like they always told her not to go walking beyond the gate because it was all overgrown and there were snakes in that part of the backyard, but she goes for a walk back there and finds that essentially there's like a miniature Stonehenge set up in the back. And so all these kind of pieces come together and it turns out that, the spirit of her father was right in warning her not to go back there because there's a certain ritual that they want to perform on her 19th birthday so that they can do what uh, all what you know supernatural cults do and that is bring a spirit of this uh entity that they worship into her body so it's it's a uh, you know good old fashioned ritual 
type uh folk horror film but it's it, it really is surprising uh and one that really wasn't on my radar until a shutter put it on their streaming service and also when it was featured in the documentary and it's uh, it's interesting too because the the entity that they find out that the cult that her aunt and uncle are a part of is actually a celtic cult that came to australia after being uh, kind of kicked out of of their their homeland. So it's interesting. It's a very like interesting setting for like a Celtic cult and this whole backstory of why they're doing what they're doing. So it's I, I kind of like how it plays with locations and kind of subverts expectations to some degree because it turned into a different movie than I was expecting, but in a good way. Yeah, I just watched this for the first time right before we started recording. Uh, so this one's still pretty fresh in my head. And uh, Derek, the point you made about how where the aunt and uncle live is, you know, maybe not fully out in the country, but it's kind of like in the outskirts. I, I think that's an interesting conversation the movie is having about kind of being at the boundary. Like it's... You know, these are people who live in, you know, a comfortable suburban home, but it is just on the outskirts of kind of like an overgrown wilderness, which is kind of where all the the mystical and frankly evil stuff is residing. Uh, so it's, um, yeah, I think that along with, as you said, it's kind of like carrying those old customs and those old rituals like they've they've left they they've uh they they flew the coop you know and left ireland and wound up in australia uh which you know i think we would need to talk to someone you know from australia to really like get into the the weeds on that but i think there's probably a very interesting dynamic that australia has and you know to a certain extent that america has with kind of the old country with you know the with the european continent and that the stuff that has followed us here um and the the fact that you know i think what's interesting about allison's birthday is it is something that stretches not just time but also space and that you know it's it's something that has has followed people across an ocean yeah that was the aspect of it that i found really fascinating just the idea that you know these these beliefs and these religions and, you know, however you want to describe it, they carried over. And so you can have a full core story in any country that could tie back to a different country entirely, because that's where, you know, the group of people that we're looking at, that's where they came from generations ago. And this part still exists, even though we're in a completely different setting now. Yeah, it almost reminds me now that I'm thinking of it, kind of like how in Halloween 3, you have the silver shamrock traces back to... <laughs> as soon as this. I saw Stonehenge, that's what I thought. <laughs> Stonehenge. We had a time so, getting it here. <laughs> right, exactly. It couldn't be all connected. We don't know for sure, but... <laughs> oh, the, the girls, the the spirit, uh, the the person that gets resurrected, they keep the, her last name is Thorn. Cult of Thor. Oh <gasps> my gosh. It all comes together. Wow. So this, this is the real Halloween four. Yes. <laughs> Although maybe Halloween three and then Halloween three is actually Halloween four. Well, there's, that, there's, there's so many Halloween universes at this point is like, we can just have, you know, this is the, <laughs> this is the Australia Halloween universe. I love it. <laughs> and it's, it, it's interesting because it didn't really like the movie itself is more I, it, it's like almost kind of a slow burn ominous and it, it didn't really, it, it almost, it, the violence in that didn't really, it, it, it more hints at it than actually like I kept expecting it to like really get like disturbing or violent, but it kind of more like crept under your skin and then still had this like really like downer of an ending where they like actually went there, which I didn't really expect them to um, with how they end things where it's like, Oh wow. That, that was a bold move, but it's, uh, yeah, it's, it, I really enjoyed it though. I just, I love that like time capsule of a movie too, that early or that late seventies, early eighties horror sweet spot. So that was, uh, it was fun to see them, uh, to see them do kind of their version of like, uh, 
almost like a silver shamrock ritual there with uh with the, the minute as they refer to it a miniature stonehenge in the backyard so <laughs> and and also when you have like more um elderly characters who are you know they put up they're acting so sweet and like you know affectionate and like they just want the best for their young supposedly their young niece uh but then they have this like sinister side i just love how this poor it, girl is gaslit <laughs> so hard in yes this movie. yes <laughs> Oh, these people suck. Uh, yeah, they do. <laughs> yeah, I, I was getting a lot of like, you know, you get kind of Rosemary's Baby vibes mm -hmm. just in terms of like that, uh, that conspiracy where you don't know who's in on it. And it seems like, you know, everybody seems to be in on it. Uh, I definitely think Ari Aster owes uh, director Ian Coughlin like a Coke because a lot of hereditary, <laughs> I think, came from some of the same broad strokes that came from this movie as well for sure i could see that yeah 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 i could see that just without that really cool open air jeep that pete drives around and with the the floral print on the seats yeah it was like, like I, a I dune buggy that. on steroids that thing was <laughs> yeah. so cool i'm like how do i get one of those <laughs> it's like he's driving a go-kart around but it's like it's, it's street legal it's just <laughs> amazing but <laughs> And I got to say, I did. I thought that Pete was going to there's this the, the cemetery scene where everyone shows up and they're going to kill him with a pitchfork. And just the whole way that scene plays out is like kind of went uh, subverted what I was expecting, like just how it's it abruptly like shifts gears in a way. And uh, you get to meet a lot of the other members of the cult. And it's it's a very interesting dynamic. But th so there's some humor in there, too, which I thought was interesting. Yeah, I, I think if I have a quibble about this movie, though, it's that they do follow Pete a little bit too much. Uh, Allison, you know, her name's in the title, but she doesn't have a lot of agency in this movie. Um, you know, she is yeah. kind of held up mm -hmm. in bed for a good portion of it while Pete is trying to, like, you know, dig into what all this means. And, you know, I, I think the the ending for as dark as it is makes it a little bit more interesting just in terms of kind of where Allison lands in the whole thing. Um, but yeah, it, it would have been, I think a little bit more interesting to, you know, this could have been something where they maybe had Allison be the one who was finding out this information. You know, uh, I, I'm sure somewhere in that house, they probably had some books about what it was they were doing. Um, so it would, have, <laughs> it would have been interesting to see her kind of figuring this stuff out for herself. Um, but yeah, that, that ending was, that was something. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh, yeah. We, we talk about how, you know, uh, which finder general kind of pulls up a little bit at the end and makes it not quite so bleak. That's not the case with, with this one. Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, also, also kind of an interesting, you know, conversation about uh, kind of fear of aging, um, you know, and how, you know, the, there's an old woman who was supposed to be her like great, great grandmother. Um, and it's kind of like that trope of like, this person is so old, they're scary now. <laughs> um, so it's just, you know, that's, that's an interesting component to the movie too. It, it is. Yeah. Because there's a scene where Pete's like sleuthing around and he l literally just opens the bedroom door and looks at the great, great grandmother, but, and there's really nothing unusual going on. They just kind of look at each other. And then he goes back to the bedroom and says, we got to go right now. <laughs> like, <laughs> like he just saw like, I don't know. It just, it felt like, well, you know, it wasn't that unusual. <laughs> like, yeah. it, I oh my God, God, an old lady. lady. <laughs> <laughs> right. Run. <laughs> but yeah, it's, and I, I can't help but think of like Ty West X too now, like when yes. it kind of makes me look at these movies a little differently and like, you know, obviously it's mortality is something we all deal with too. So it's an interesting, it's kind of a timeless thing. Um, so it's, but yeah, it is interesting how that all plays out and, there's a lot of a lot of elements that they throw into this movie in in the blender and just hit play on it. So, <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, they hit frappe and, you know, it's something <laughs> something pretty interesting came out of it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll go with uh, I think we're to me for my final pick. Uh, you know, I went with a very kind of quintessential uh pick for my first one i'm gonna go a little bit off the beaten path and actually go with one that's pretty recent i'm gonna go with the 2020 film candisha 
Um, this was one that kind of came out of nowhere for me um, and turned into one of my favorites of 2020. Uh, and it's it's one that I think I need to make a case for in terms of being folk horror. Um, it was directed by uh, the directors of Inside, uh, Alexander Bustillo and Julian Mari. Uh, and this takes place in uh you know kind of urban paris and takes place in a kind of a lower class uh, a poor neighborhood uh where there's these three teenage girls who you know are very connected to each other and very connected to their neighborhood you know you get a sense very quickly that you know the kind of the the, the small town that connection to the land has carried over to an urban environment. You know, these are girls that uh, they spend their time in an abandoned uh, high rise building and do, you know, like mural painting and graffiti and stuff like that. Um, but you can tell there's, you know, the same way that in a lot of folk horror movies, uh, people are connected to those rural landscapes. I think these girls are equally connected to this urban landscape. Um, and so, you know, the, the crux of the movie comes when uh, one of the girls is assaulted by kind of her stalker ex-boyfriend and in a kind of a you know post-traumatic fit of rage she calls upon the Aisha Kandisha uh, which is a Moroccan legend a Moroccan demon uh, who will kind of come and do your bidding you know take your vengeance uh, but it comes you know we talked about some things coming at a cost uh, in this case the cost is you have to pay in uh, six other men that you love. Uh, and so she kind of does it in this, you know, kinda, again, this, um, I don't think she really thinks necessarily that anything is going to happen, um, but it's just kind of a way for her to process and get through it. Uh, but uh, sure enough, Candisha does appear. Uh, she takes care of the ex-boyfriend um, and then, you know, the, the bill comes due. Um, and there are, you know, a lot of men that you're introduced to, uh, boys and men in her life that start dying off. Um, and I do think that there are similarities here to, you know, one of the movies that they talk about in, uh, in the documentary is Candyman as folk horror. You know, I think this is of a similar vein. Uh, I think what is very different, though, is that whereas in Candyman, it's someone's curiosity getting the better of them uh, in Candisha, it's more, you know, the the kind of the passion or the heat of the moment getting the better of them. Um, uh, but there definitely is, you know, that connection to the land. And there's also that exploration of things that are way older than us that we don't understand. Um and that we can't control once we've unleashed it. Uh, so it was, I think this was a really good movie and I do think it, it, it is a good entry for the, the, the folk horror subgenre. I like this one too, um, though I did, I was a little bit surprised when I watched it because given that it was um, from the directors of Inside, which was such a brutally violent movie. <laughs> I was like stealing myself, like, okay, we're going to watch the new one by these guys. Ready, I'm ready. <laughs> it really wasn't nearly as intense as their prior effort, which is good because I think it opens the door to a wider audience. Um, but I kind of had to recalibrate based on that. Like, okay, this is the type of movie that we're watching now, not what I was expecting. Mm -hmm. um, but I loved the relationship between the girls and how it was so such a focal point of the entire story and the way they relied on one another and you know the way that that relationship was so vital between the characters I really love that aspect of it yeah yeah there's you know a lot of where whereas inside was a very not just brutal but a very cold movie there's a, a warmth at play in this movie that I think is, uh, you know, I think not just the, because there are definitely, it's very violent in certain scenes, you know, and there are some flashes of that, uh, you know, new French extremity kind of realistic, you know, this isn't a gag, this is like really horrific violence. Um, but, you know, I think the mix of the fact that it's a supernatural entity kind of takes some of the sting off of that. You know, it doesn't feel like mm -hmm. we're watching a snuff clip like in some of those uh, new French extremity movies. Uh, and that that 
connection that the protagonists have with one another, I think, you know, keeps it from being just like that utter bleak that you get from inside. Yeah. I haven't seen Candisha, but I really, I love that you picked it though, because it really reflects how, you know, it, it doesn't have to be out in the prairie or in some rural landscape for it to be like considered folk horror and how the, uh, how you mentioned the documentary makes the case that like Candyman can be viewed as a folk horror film. And so you can have these uh, more like uh, like a city environment be the setting for a folk horror film, especially as even even like seen in the uh, documentary, how they're talking like the back to the land movement with the industrial age kind of coming into play in England. It kind of like it feels like you always take a piece of that with you, whether you live in the city or you live in the countryside. And so I feel like there's always no matter where you live, there can be like a folk horror connection so I, I think that's really interesting that you know you can view a movie like this through that lens and it still is you know can be considered folk horror and it's interesting too where you know i think part of the way it diverges with Candyman is you know it's an in candy man it's an urban setting and it's you know an urban myth that doesn't go back very far you know it's something that well i mean you know uh, uh, relatively you know it's something that goes back you know 100, 150 years, you know, back to, you know, around the Civil War. Um, but here, you know, it's a, a modern city that reaches back to a myth that goes back, you know, hundreds of years. I think it's like 15th century or something like that. Um, you know, and, and I think that's part of part of that, I guess, has to do with location, you know, because, you know, when we're talking about America, there's only so far back at least from from the white lens um, uh, of, of, you know, the, the people who have stolen the land for the people who were there a lot longer ago, um, you know, but from, you know, the from white American lens, you know, the, the history is not going to go back as far if you're looking at it um, in something in America, in something in Europe, in something, you know, with Paris, there is that uh, the, the, the kind of the, the ghosts of those old rituals go back a lot farther. Um, so being able to play with that, the disparity between those two things, I think, is is heightened in a place like like in Paris. Absolutely. <laughs> Anything else about uh, Candisha? I feel like it's one of those films that um, a bunch of people watched when it first hit shutter and then everyone stopped talking about. I think <laughs> more people need to watch it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, with I you, have Derek. a lot of, I have a lot of, yeah, I know <laughs> that's what this episode is all about. It's to get me to watch Candisha, but, um, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's funny because I feel like there's so many movies on shutter too, where it's like, there's that really big first week or two where like everyone's talking about it. But if like, if you are like out of town or if you're busy with something else and you forget about it and then it's like on to the next thing and then you're like, Oh wait, this is still on here. I need to watch this. <laughs> There's, uh, and I love how, and they have like the whole um, new French extremity section and everything like that now too. So there's a lot of movies that are on my to watch list and, but it, I love having these conversations though, because then I'm like, well, that just bumped it up, you know, above the hundred other movies that I have to watch. <laughs> and that's only on shutter too. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. That's not uh, even, you know, including Tubi, which is a whole nother dimension. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That is just like, uh, Tubi is just kind of like that. Uh, yeah. It's like a parallel dimension of just like, there's a whole nother realm of movies that you're going to find on there. Um, but all stuff that like, you know, I, I think that there's, you know, you're probably liable to find some folk horror stuff on there too, because I think, as we said earlier, folk horror is one of those things that it's where you find it. You know, I don't think it is anything that has any real strict, you know, guide rails about what it has to be. Uh, there are some things that, you know, are, are definitely kind of like benchmarks for it, but, um, you know, you can find, you know, secrets hidden in our past you can find connection to the land in a lot of different movies um you know i i was half kidding when i said friday the 13th but like you could make an argument for that like if 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 something like lake of the dead is about a group of people going to a lake and being kind of like afflicted by this spirit or by this sense of something that happened there in the past then what is you know camp crystal lake and jason Voorhees, if not that <laughs> 
Um, so, so especially Friday the 13th part five, because we're talking about someone becoming Jason. Exactly. <laughs> yes. <laughs> becoming the folk horror. <laughs> da- Danny Steinman is a folk horror director. Yes. I think we've, <laughs> we've come to that conclusion. And I think there's really no better way to conclude than that. I think Patrick Bromley, uh, our very own Patrick Bromley will appreciate the fact that we have designated Friday the 13th, a new beginning as folk horror. That's what we're going out on. Uh, so I love it. <laughs> uh, thank you, Emily and Derek, for joining me on this talk about folk horror. Uh, thanks, everybody, for listening. Uh, we want to thank Brian, our engineer, for helping us out each and every episode. And as always, we want to thank you, our listeners, uh, including those of you who have signed up for a Corpse Club membership. Uh, be sure to visit corpseclub.com to check out our latest episode. Uh, you can also sign up to become a member, which will get you access to a uh, bonus episode that'll get you some various daily dead and corpse club swag uh corpse club membership card t-shirt all that good stuff Uh, don't forget to rate and review us on apple podcasts every rating and review helps you can also find us on google play soundcloud and all of your favorite podcast providers Uh, if you want to get in touch you can reach us anytime at contact at corpseclub.com or on twitter at daily dead news or at corpse club and on instagram and facebook under corpse club thanks again for listening and until next time Stay scary.